It's such a joy to be here on this legendary stage, especially today as we're living through what will be known in history as the legendary year. The year AGI fell off the hype cycle. No, no, no. The year when AI became radically mainstream. I mean, isn't your grandma using ChatGPT? I bet she is. So my name is Alyssa Vishnik, and I am the CEO of Y Labs, the AI observability company. And something incredible happened today, completely off the script now. This is the first time I'm speaking on stage after somebody who already defined observability for me. Thank you, Umbam. It's amazing how we are all in sync about what's important, uh, what we have to pay attention to in order to get AI to become useful and to make the positive impact. Um, my specialty is building tools for robust and responsible AI adoption. And for the past decade, which is forever, uh, I've been focusing on the tool chain that is important for AI applications once they are deployed to production. And unsurprisingly, I'm super passionate about observability. And I hope that by the end of my talk, um, 19 more minutes, you are as passionate as me about observability. And if not, you're at least really well informed. So AI is everywhere. In the past decade, it went from something we read about in research papers to something we interact with every single day. In fact, I'm a bit of a statistics nerd, so I've been estimating that any one of you on any given day has about 100 AI-powered experiences per hour, which is mind-boggling. And thanks to all the amazing work that the people in this room and the people who are listening online are doing, this number is increasing. You interact with AI every time you unlock your phone. Uh, you interact with AI every time you read an email, every time you browse a website. And as we're burning more and more AI experiences to the edge of our, of our physical world, AI is impacting everything about our life, including our health. And as Steve was saying, we wake up every morning with the dream of making AI more useful, making AI help us become more productive, become healthier. And that's amazing. It drives every one of us. However, there are still challenges. And I'm, I tend to be a bit of a naysayer because you know I work, I work on AI in production once it's already there in the wild. So what are these challenges? Well, it starts with how we build AI, and this is a very simple, oversimplified AI lifecycle. And it starts with us collecting the data and cleaning the data, and then designing the model, training the model, optimizing this model for our favorite environment for the device where it's going to be deployed. And then we typically monitor for the performance of this model. And the performance of this model, um, just like we were talking about earlier, it's just a bunch of numbers, as Pete was pointing out. It's just you know statistics, it's probabilities. It's not particularly relevant to how your user is experiencing the AI-powered uh, application. And there are a number of problems with this process, and anybody who's gotten a model to production knows that this process is long and has a really high probability of failure and notoriously has a very low ROI. And there are a few reasons why. First of all, this is a discrete process. I mean, no software process has a beginning and an end like this. You don't just you know, build the application and you're done and you move on to the next thing. And the second problem with this thing is that there are no feedback loops. That's where observability becomes very handy. So as Anupam pointed out, observability is a property of a software system. Basically what it means is that you can look at the outputs that your system is generating and understand whether the system is healthy, whether the system is useful to your end user. So when it comes to AI, observability is all this data, rich data, that describes 
how your model is doing in the wild, in production. How is it impacting your users? And model performance here is a great stepping stone to be better, to have those feedback loops. But it's not enough, because when you're monitoring the model performance, you have to define, you have to enumerate what are you monitoring for? What is the metrics that you're capturing? What are your thresholds? And AI systems are too complex to be able to enumerate all of the things that you care about and all of the things that could go wrong so you can measure them. In fact, um, my favorite thing to talk about is actually the complexities, the complexities of how AI can go wrong because as we're building this, these are the most important things for us to think about. And I lean on the incredible researchers. Uh, so I'm going to present a handful of complexities of how AI can go wrong <laughs> through the research of three incredible, uh, three incredible scientists who have been named uh, the most influential people in AI this year by time. Uh, first off, oops, wrong button. Uh, first off is Dr. Emily Bender. And she has been making the idea of AI limitations very accessible for the entire decade. And if you don't know her, please Google her. She coined a very famous term, uh, stochastic parrots, which is how she describes AI. And I love this uh, because I have a pet parrot, a talking pet parrot. And, uh, his name is Luigi. And anybody who meets him for the first time, they're fascinated. They're like, oh my god, this bird is so intelligent. It like, says his name and responds to me and laughs almost like totally in sync with the crowd. That's amazing. But as you start interacting with him and introduce him to situations that he has not mastered, you realize that you know whenever he doesn't know what to say, he just responds with a random phrase. And that's exactly how ChatGPT works. Uh, I'm sure you've already experienced that. So Emily Bender makes it very accessible and points out that when you're building AI for the end user, for the consumer, you have to think about the limitations. And observability is what helps you identify these limitations once your AI application is there, is in the wild, is interacting with your users. The second person whose work is incredibly instrumental here is Joy Blomini. And Dr. Blomini works on surfacing the biases, uh, actually biases that are embedded in very popular face recognition systems. And if you haven't seen her movie called Coded Bias, please make it into your watch list because that's an absolute must for every AI practitioner. And you know, we talk about AI biases all the time. Basically what it means is that when your application, AI-powered application, is running and interacting with your users, there are segments of your users that are getting very good uh, experiences, and there are segments of your users that are getting suboptimal experiences. And hopefully, in your case, suboptimal means, well, just lack of conversion and not discrimination, which would be awful. However, if you're not observing, if you are not instrumenting your system, and if you're not tracking how your AI-powered application is impacting different cohorts of your users, you will never know. And then hopefully, you wouldn't experience the moment when Joy emails you and says, hey, this is what I found in your amazing AI experience. And the last researcher who I'll highlight today is Dr. Rumam Chaudhuri. And on this photo, she is running one of the first of its kind events during DEF CON security conference this year. And the event is the red teaming event specifically focused on generative AI applications. In our case, currently LLMs are most popular. And during that event, uh, which had more than 2,000 participants, they have uncovered thousands of what she calls embedded harms, which are basically ways that an adversary can manipulate the end AI experience and cause it to act and, uh, well, to cause harm to the user experience. Everything from getting your AI application to leak confidential data to getting your AI application to change how it works, including not just for you, the end user, but for all other end users that 
uh, can main after you after you uh, interact with it as an adversary. So this highlights that, again, the risks that we could see once the AI application is deployed to production, once it's in the wild, are really, really hard to enumerate. I mean, you can't think of you know, what, what 2,000 people can come in and, and kind of uh, break uh, the experience. And this is, again, where observability is super important because it allows you to continuously identify, continuously analyze all of these experiences that are kind of uh, outliers or edges to what you have intentionally designed and fix them and improve them. So hopefully by now you are a believer that, that observability is useful and necessary and now we can talk about the edge and you know as all of you know building things for the edge is a lot harder than just in the cloud environment. A lot of things, a, a lot of aspects of Edge AI uh, add an additional layer of complexity. This complexity comes from the fact that uh, there's limitation to compute, there's limitation to memory. Also, it's very hard to get the data off the devices and to ship changes to the devices. It takes many, many years to develop a beautiful device as Steve was sharing with us. And then if you are not investing into that data collection that Steve was highlighting. It's really, really hard to retrofit that. And at Ylabs, we work with customers from you know, the household names like Square and Glassdoor to AI for startups. And recently, we worked with a customer who had a fleet of devices deployed. And the devices, were, the devices are running computer vision uh, algorithms to do object detection, and they wanted to enable observability. They wanted to start gathering that signal that would help them improve the user experience because the end user experience was not working out well. So we started working with them, and what we realized is that in order to retrofit this data gathering exercise from their devices, it would take us about six months of working together, which is a really long time. I mean, like, six months ago, we didn't even have ChatGPT. Can you imagine that? Um, so retrofitting that is really, really hard. And that's the first insight uh, to think about. And as Steve was highlighting, this data gathering exercise, this ability to gather the signals about how your AI is performing is not only critical to make sure that your ex the experiences that you're building are not biased and are not creating security loopholes, it's also a competitive advantage. It's your way to make sure that you're continuously building better AI applications. So through working with this customer, uh, I've identified three more non-obvious things about you know, how do you get observability to the edge devices? And I would like to share them. The first one is about gathering signal and instrumenting every single layer of your uh, edge AI application. And that starts from, you know, your sensors, your hardware, your operating system, and your software system. Through this experience working with the customer, we have identified that model performance was suffering in cases where the drivers were outdated in the devices that they were deploying to. And they did not anticipate that their customers are gonna have all these outdated drivers. And that hindered the model performance. That was really hard to debug. We've also identified that the sensors were configured differently. And with these different configurations, the performance is not uh, exactly as they, they were anticipating, the performance degrades. And the third thing that was surprising is that the operators that operate these devices could operate them not how you expect it. Um, you know, the, for example, operators of handheld ultrasound devices, they could use them anywhere on your body, not just on your wrist as you designed. So it's very important to gather that signal from every layer of your application to understand how every layer impacts your end experience. The second insight is that you have to care about the end user experience. How does the end user respond to your AI application? Your model performance could be perfect, but nobody's using the application, or they use it once and then they leave. So tracking that and 
constantly monitoring that and watching that in alignment with all other signal about your application is absolutely critical to understand whether what you build is useful. Does anybody care about this really expensive and really wonderful AI model? instrumenting and getting data effectively from every layer of your application to enable that observability. So investing into your development platform, investing into your data platform is something that you have to do early on because there's a lot of configuration that will have to go in in order for you to start enabling observability and start creating these feedback loops. All right, so hopefully by now, this entire room is full of observability advocates observability influencers. And so far, everything I've told you makes you feel like observability is a huge endeavor. But it doesn't have to be, because you can do something today. And there are three things that you can do, actually. The first thing is you can start facilitating the culture of responsibility, the culture of robust and responsible AI adoption. And it's very easy to do that, because I gave you three examples that you can follow, uh, three amazing researchers whose work uh, can be shared. Uh, it's really well vetted and really reliable. So that's where you start. The second thing you can do is ask your team just one question. Who is observing our AI system? Whether it's already in production or not, who is observing? And oh, probably they'll be a bit perplexed at the beginning. But this question really surfaces one very important insight. Because if the answer to this question is, we don't know, or nobody, that means that your customer is observing. That means that you're going to be learning about all of the issues with your AI system directly from your end user about the biases, about the security loopholes, about how annoying certain experiences are, and that's very undesirable. So that's a big question to ask, and that is what's going to get you on the path to ask the next set of questions. And lastly, what you can do is start investing into the tools ecosystem. So we've spoken about ecosystem a lot today, and you know, as I described, there's a lot of complexity in getting these tools in place. However, today is a great day. You are here at Imagine, surrounded by ecosystem builders, uh, and Edge Impulse is one of the pioneers of the Edge AI ecosystem. So you're in a very good place to start. Seize that opportunity. All right, so if there was one thought that I could leave you with, it would be this. Design every AI application as if your family are the customers. Your parents, your siblings, your kids, your grandkids, if you're planning for that. And the reason for that is, well, simple. Um, I really wanted to have an impactful slide, so I asked Midjourney to imagine for me how my little girl is growing up in the world of dangerous AI. And of course, you know, this is pretty post-apocalyptic. Uh, my, my daughter is two and a half, so this is like a five-year-old. Uh, things are moving pretty fast here. Uh, but they don't have to be, right? We don't have to be in this doom and gloom, because the people here in this room have all the power to imagine the world where AI is productive, is positively impacting every one of us is making us healthier, is making us more efficient. And that's what we're here today. So hopefully, um, leaving on the positive note, <laughs> nothing stands between uh, me and lunch anymore. We can get together and network for the rest of the conference and discuss how can we actually build that world of positively impacting AI. Thank you. Sure, <laughs>